Padre Pio was a revered saint who was bestowed with the sacred stigmata, and he bore these wounds with dignity and humility. He lived a life full of pain and suffering and endured everything in silence. The light that enabled him to overcome all hardships was thanks to his steadfast devotion to Jesus Christ. In the moments before Padre Pio died, Jesus Christ himself appeared and spoke to him. He is also a saint who bears the five wounds of Christ, having the glory of experiencing his pain, suffering, and sacrifice in the journey of salvation. In addition to the wounds from the nails and spears, St. Pio was also given the laceration that our Lord suffered on his shoulder, a wound from carrying the cross, which we know was inflicted by Jesus revealed to St. Bernard. Living Saint of the 20th Century Padre Pio was born into a poor peasant family in the rural Italian town of Pietrelcina. When he was a child, Pio told his parents his wish to become a monk, and his parents also very supported this dream of Pio. He was tutored privately until he entered the novitiate of the Capuchin friars at the age of 15. Of feeble health but strong will, with the help of grace, he completed the required studies and was ordained a priest in 1910. His whole life was marked by long hours of prayer and continual austerity. His letters to his spiritual directors reveal the ineffable suffering, physical and spiritual, which accompanied him all through his life. They also reveal his deep union with God and his burning love for the Blessed Eucharist and Our Blessed Lady. Padre Pio was recognized as an extraordinary confessor, reader of souls, and worker of miracles. Like many holy men and women in the history of the Church, he had a checkered relationship with ecclesiastical authorities, both within his Capuchin order and in Rome. In the 1920s, his faculties to celebrate the sacraments publicly were revoked due to a variety of accusations made against him. The Holy See further declared that nothing divine could be found in his experiences. Only in 1933 did he see some light at the end of the tunnel as Pope Pius XI said that his actions against Pio were not because he was badly disposed, but badly informed. Pius XII was rather favorable to him, while John XXIII was not. It was only Paul VI who dismissed all the allegations against him. Father Karol Wojtyla visited him in 1947, and according to one story, Padre Pio told him that he would be Pope and that he saw blood on his pontificate. That anecdote was never confirmed or denied by Pope John Paul II. Padre Pio was beatified by John Paul II in 1999 and canonized by the same Pope in 2002. The Message from Jesus Before Padre Pio's Death For half the 20th century, Saint Padre Pio suffered the wounds of Christ, all of them, including the cynicism of doubt and the tyranny of false witness. May you have heard about two of the Church's most revered treasures, the Shroud of Turin and the Volto Santo, the image of the Holy Face hidden for 400 years and believed to be the second burial cloth of Jesus, the Sudarium. There is an ancient legend that a woman offered her head cloth to wipe the face of Jesus on the way to Golgotha. When he gave it back to her, as the story has it, an impression of his face remained on the veil. What is now the sixth station of the cross has been legendary in Rome since the 8th century. The name tradition has given to that woman is Veronica, a name that appears nowhere in the gospel narrative of the Passion of Christ. The veil is believed to be one of two burial cloths of Jesus. On the morning of the resurrection, the Gospel of John reports the smaller burial cloth of Jesus, the veil covering his face, was rolled up in a place by itself as witnessed by St. Peter and St. John. In Jewish custom in the time of Jesus, such a veil covered the faces of dignitaries, such as the high priest in death before being entombed. It is this veil that many now believe is enshrined at Manopello. In contrast to that other, larger burial cloth, believed by many to be the Shroud of Turin, the image on the veil is not that of a dead man, however, but of a man very much alive, his eyes wide open. 
it is Jesus Christ having conquered death. Paul McLeod reported in the article that Capuchin priest, Father Domenico de Cese, formerly custodian of the shrine, was killed in an accident while visiting the Shroud of Turin in 1978. A decade earlier, however, Father Domenico wrote of a rather strange occurrence. On the morning of September 22, 1968, Father Domenico opened the doors of the shrine and was startled to find Padre Pio kneeling in prayer before the image of the Holy Face. Padre Pio was at the same time 200 kilometers away at San Giovanni Rotondo, gravely ill and near death. It was his last known occurrence of bilocation, a phenomenon that, like his visible wounds, became a source of skepticism about Padre Pio, both in and outside of the church. In the hours before his death, Padre Pio contemplated the burial cloth of Christ. After 50 years of bearing the visible wounds of Christ, Padre Pio's own soul sought out this visible link to Jesus beyond death, not Jesus crucified, a reality Padre Pio himself had lived for 50 years, but the image of the face of the risen Christ. Those September days preceding Padre Pio's death in 1968 must have been the strangest of his life. The visible wounds became so central to his sense of self for a half century that everyone imagined he had difficulty even remembering a time when the wounds were not present. Even a great burden carried for years upon years can become a part of who and what we are. We cannot imagine Padre Pio without these wounds. We would have never even heard of Padre Pio without these wounds. So in that sense, the wounds were not for him. They were for us. Last Days and Last Mass of Padre Pio Advanced in age, his health began to deteriorate in the 1960s. On September 21, 1968, the day after his 50th anniversary of receiving the stigmata, he suddenly started feeling very tired. He was supposed to offer a solemn Mass the next day for pilgrims, but asked his superior if he could celebrate a low Mass. Though his superior initially granted his request, the huge crowd of pilgrims who came to visit changed his mind. Weak and fragile, Padre Pio offered a solemn Mass. Little did he and those present know it would be his last Mass. He would die within just a few hours of finishing. That night he laid down even weaker, and it became clear to those with him that he might reach the end. He confessed, renewed his Franciscan vows, and mouthed Hail Marys while clutching his rosary. That evening, about 9 war p.m. on 22nd September 1968, Padre Pio used the intercom to call Padre Pellegrino to come to his room. When Pellegrino answered Padre Pio's call and entered his room, he found him in bed and noticed that his eyes were red with tears. Padre Pio had called him because he wanted to know what time it was. Pellegrino dried Padre Pio's tears with a handkerchief and told him the time. After he checked to make sure that Padre Pio was all right, he went back to his room. During the evening, Padre Pio called Padre Pellegrino to his room five or six times, asking for small necessities. Every time Pellegrino entered the room, he noticed tears in Padre Pio's eyes. Nevertheless, Padre Pio joked with him by calling him Don Pellegrino rather than the usual, my son or my brother. He always called him Don Pellegrino whenever he wanted to make him laugh. Around midnight, Padre Pio asked Padre Pellegrino if he would stay on in his room with him and he was happy to do so. Usually, Padre Pellegrino sat in the armchair, but on this night, Padre Pio wanted him to sit right beside his bed. He took Padre Pellegrino's hand in his and held it tightly. Padre Pio began to tremble like a frightened child. Every few minutes, he wanted to know the time. Padre Pellegrino didn't know what to make of it. It almost seemed as though he had an appointment with someone. He continued to wipe the tears from Padre Pio's eyes and to stay close beside him. A little after midnight, Padre Pio asked Padre Pellegrino if he had celebrated Mass. Spiritual Father, it is too early to say Mass, Padre Pellegrino answered. Today you will celebrate the Mass for me, Padre Pio said. 
Padre Pellegrino did not understand Padre Pio's words and replied, But I say Mass every day for your intentions. Today you will say Mass for my soul, Padre Pio said. The words sounded strange to Padre Pellegrino, but he did not ask for an explanation. He then asked Padre Pellegrino to hear his confession. Padre Pellegrino was not his regular confessor, but he had heard his confession many times in the past, and he heard it on this night. If the Lord calls me today, ask the brothers to forgive me for all the trouble I have been to them, and ask them and all my spiritual children to pray for my soul, Padre Pio said. Padre Pellegrino assured him that he had no need to worry, for he still had a long time yet to live. Nevertheless, Padre Pellegrino added, But if it is indeed near the time of your death, I ask you for a last blessing for the brothers and for all of your spiritual children. Padre Pio answered, I bless them all and I ask you to have the superior give them this last blessing for me. Padre Pio then said that he wanted to renew his religious vows. At these words, Padre Pellegrino grew frightened because in the Capuchin tradition, the only time the vows of religious profession are renewed is when one is on his deathbed. Padre Pio was putting everything in order down to the last detail. Padre Pellegrino listened as Padre Pio renewed his vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Padre Pio said, I... Padre Pio of Pietrelcina, vow and promise to Almighty God, to the Blessed Virgin Mary, to our Holy Father St. Francis, to all the saints and to you, Father, to observe all the days of my life, the rule of the Friars Minor confirmed by Pope Honorius, and to live in obedience without property and in chastity. Padre Pellegrino spoke the response, If you abide by this on behalf of God, I promise you eternal life. Padre Pio said, that he could not breathe well in bed and wanted to get up. Are there any stars in the sky tonight? Padre Pio asked. Yes, indeed. The sky is studded with stars tonight, Padre Pellegrino replied. Let us go to the veranda then and see, Padre Pio said. Padre Pio had severe arthritis, and at 81 years of age, his posture was stooped and bent. Because it was very painful for him to walk, he used a wheelchair most of the time. But on this night, for some reason, he was able to stand up straight and he walked briskly and with great ease to the veranda, needing no assistance. He suddenly looked twenty years younger. When Padre Pio got to the veranda, he reached over and turned on the light. That was something he had not done in so long that everyone could not even remember. Padre Pio then began to stare intently at a particular area on the veranda. Padre Pellegrino could not understand what he was looking at with such concentration, but soon he would understand. He was staring at the exact place where the Capuchins would carry his lifeless body in just a few short hours. Suddenly, Padre Pio began to feel very ill. He wanted to go back to his room, but he was too weak to stand up. Padre Pellegrino quickly went to get a wheelchair. Meanwhile, all of the color had drained out of Padre Pio's face, and he was growing weaker by the minute. He began to repeat the words, Jesus, Mary, over and over. All the while, his voice was growing fainter. A doctor arrived in less than 10 minutes and realized that Padre Pio was having a severe bronchial asthma attack. He gave him an injection as well as oxygen in an attempt to ease his breathing, which had become difficult and labored. By that time, fathers, brothers, and the other Capuchins had gathered in Padre Pio's room. While the doctors were doing their very best to help Padre Pio, the Capuchins knelt beside him and prayed the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the prayer for a holy death, and the prayer to St. Joseph, patron of the dying. Together, the Capuchins repeated, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, I give you my heart and my soul. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, assist me in my last agony. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, may my soul peacefully expire in you. The holy oils were prepared, and Father Paolo gave Padre Pio the last rites. Padre Pio was fully conscious and was very much aware of all that was happening. His feet and hands were becoming very cold, 
and he was perspiring heavily. When the doctors realized that he was having a heart attack, he was given an injection directly into his heart. With his eyes closed, he continued to repeat the words, Jesus, Mary. Toward the end, his lips formed the words, but he could make no sound, not even a whisper. The Capuchins called out to him, Padre, Padre. He opened his eyes one last time and looked at his dear brothers. At 2.30 a.m. on 23rd September 1968, with his rosary clasped in his hands, Padre Pio gently bowed his head and died. Those who had been present during Padre Pio's final moments stated that it was the most gentle and beautiful passing that they had ever witnessed. Padre Pio had lived a holy life and he had died a holy death. The Five Wounds of Christ On September 7, 1910, in his first year of ministry, Padre Pio received the first stigmata beneath the elm tree in Piana Romana. In a letter he wrote to his spiritual leader, he describes the incident. In the center of my hands, a red spot appeared, about the size of a coin, and with it, an intense pain in the soles of my feet. This pain in his hands and feet was the first occurrence of the stigmata, even though they were not visible at the time. Padre Pio's stigmata became visible on September 20th, 1918. Padre Pio had finished celebrating his morning mass and was having a moment of prayer. While his mind was caught up in meditating on the passion and death of Jesus and in the painful matters of the Holy Rosary, a heavenly being appeared to him. The hands, feet, and side of this heavenly being had been pierced and were spilling blood. Somehow, he dragged himself back to his cell. He bound up his wounds as best he could, and for the next day or two tried his best to keep his hands hidden beneath the long sleeves of his habit. He was suffering both physically and spiritually. Padre Pio was fully engulfed in this intense experience. Exhausted, he fell asleep. When he awoke, he felt an incredible pain in the center of his hands and feet, and he saw that the pain was due to bloody wounds about the size of a coin two centimeters wide. Padre Pio told his spiritual director, I was praying before Christ was crucified, and I felt myself being carried away bit by bit into an ever-growing state of serenity. It was like a gentle sleep that I rejoiced in while I prayed. A great peace came over me. At one point, a mysterious being appeared before me, like the one I had seen the evening of August 5th. The only difference was that there was blood flowing from this one's hands, feet, and side. He didn't say a word, and then disappeared. When I came to, I was on the ground, wounded. Despite Pio's initial attempt, in his embarrassment and confusion to keep the wounds hidden, Father Guardian of the Friary soon recognized something was amiss. On the second or third day after the 20th of September, he came to Padre Pio's cell to confront him. Poor Pio burst into tears and admitted everything to his superior as he told him all that had happened. In a letter to Father Benedetto on October 22, 1918, he wrote, Dear Father, I am dying of pain because of the wounds and the resulting embarrassment I feel deep in my soul. I am afraid I shall bleed to death if the Lord does not hear my heartfelt supplication to relieve me of this condition. The stigmata appeared on Padre Pio on September 20, 1918 and remained until his death. The stigmata stayed the same for 50 years and never became infected, even though there were bloody open wounds. It should be noted that, at the time, antibiotics did not exist, and their availability for purchase began around 1945. Even today, doctors can't explain why they didn't get infected. Even though he had open wounds on his feet, Padre Pio was able to walk normally and carry out all his regular daily activities. On this occasion, the Lord did not see fit to answer Pio's prayer. The wounds were there to stay, and Padre Pio would bleed from them every day and night for the next 50 years. He would be the only priest in the history of the church to be recognized as bearing the stigmata of the wounds of Christ. With Padre Pio, it seems, they were to be a public sign, a gift not only for him, 
but for the good of the whole church and the world. A charism. The visible stigmata are a divine mark. They are the marks of Christ's wounds. Padre Pio was a living icon used by God to show us the suffering of his son, Jesus Christ, who underwent crucifixion and death for the love of his people. It's said that Padre Pio didn't like to show his stigmata. In fact, he always wore gloves and closed shoes, as seen in the majority of the photographs of him in public settings. Doctors and experts examined these wounds, but no one was able to provide a scientific explanation. According to the Father Guardian of the monastery where Padre Pio resided, ten minutes after Padre Pio's death, all traces of the stigmata on his hands, feet, and side had disappeared. Again, no scientist has been able to give an explanation for this. In his letters, Padre Pio speaks of a love for God and his neighbor. Yes, my soul is wounded with love for Jesus. I am sick with love. I continually experience the grievous pain of that fire that burns but does not consume. The first epistle of St. Peter teaches us, By his wounds you have been healed. It is important to recall that the cross has marked each of us. On the day of our baptism, we were claimed for Christ precisely by being signed with his cross. And every day since then, we begin every significant act by tracing on our bodies that saving sign. Padre Pio's Five Point Rule of Life in many ways, St. Pio was and is a contradiction to our scientific, rational age, and despite their eagerness to prove him a fraud, skeptics remain consistently unable to explain the many miracles that accompanied St. Pio's life. But while St. Pio is remembered as a miracle worker, he was perhaps best known in his day as a spiritual father to countless souls. He gave wise and holy counsel to those dealing with the struggles of living a holy life in the world, and through his advice, he guided many souls to heaven. To live a life full of faith and sacrifice, this is the way he trained throughout his life. First, weekly confession. Confession is the soul's bath. You must go at least once a week. I do not want souls to stay away from confession more than a week. Even a clean and unoccupied room gathers dust. Return after a week, and you will see that it needs dusting again. Second is daily communion. It is quite true, we are not worthy of such a gift. However, to approach the Blessed Sacrament in a state of mortal sin is one thing, and to be unworthy is quite another. All of us are unworthy, but it is He who invites us. It is He who desires it. Let us humble ourselves and receive him with a heart contrite and full of love. The third one, examination of conscience every evening. Someone once told Padre Pio that he thought a nightly examination of conscience was pointless because he knew what was sin as it was committed. To this, Padre Pio replied, That is true enough, but every experienced merchant in this world not only keeps track throughout the day of whether he has lost or gained on each sale, in the evening, he does the bookkeeping for the day to determine what he should do on the morrow. It follows that it is indispensable to make a rigorous examination of conscience, brief but lucid, every night. Fourth, daily spiritual reading. If you do not continuously absorb knowledge, you will become lost and no longer yourself, will become weak and afraid of everything. That is why he advised that the harm that comes to souls from the lack of reading holy books makes me shudder. What power spiritual reading has to lead to a change of course and to make even worldly people enter into the way of perfection. Last but not least is mental prayer twice daily. If you do not succeed in meditating well, do not give up doing your duty. If the distractions are numerous, do not be discouraged. Do the meditation of patience and you will still profit. Decide upon the length of your meditation, and do not leave your place before finishing, even if you have to be crucified. Why do you worry so much because you do not know how to meditate as you would like? Meditation is a means to attain God, but it is not a goal in itself. Meditation aims at the love of God and neighbor. Love God with all your soul without reserve, 
and love your neighbor as yourself and you will have accomplished half of your meditation. Of course, if you have a lot of time, pray every time you can, twice a day, three times, more, even spend half a day or a whole day just to talk to God. That's the connection you absolutely must build.